So welcome everyone to the uh, lecture series. This is, will be a very basic introduction to ultra cold gases, the physics of ultra cold gases. Actually, I request Louis to be very basic uh, so that everybody can follow. Uh, so I just introduced uh, Professor Louis Sanders from University of Hanover uh, Institute of Theoretical Physics. So uh, more than that, he's my PhD supervisor. So just to say uh, uh, the couple of words. Uh, so Louis did his uh, PhD from University of Salamanca, and then uh, he moved to Hanover for a postdoc for roughly six years with uh, uh, Magic Levenstein. And then he moved to uh, uh, University of Stuttgart uh, and where I met him actually. And then uh, we moved back to Hanover. And uh, now he's the director of the Institute of Theoretical Physics in Hanover. So, Luis, I welcome you for the lecture series, and uh, it's already, I can see the syllabus actually. Okay, so I will just forward to you. Okay, please go ahead. Yeah. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank Regis for, for the invitation to, to give this, uh, this uh, course. It's, it's a pity that I cannot be in Pune. Actually, three years ago, I was in, in Pune. I just uh, realized, actually, at this very time, I was in Guwahati with. Uh, with uh, with Taban, actually, yeah, in 2018, yeah, exactly, March. Exactly three years ago. Yeah. But uh, this year, due to the unfortunate reasons everybody knows and everybody suffers, we are uh, we have to do it online. So uh, I was asked by Regis to give you some introduction to the physics of ultra cold gases, to the theory of ultra cold gases. Although I will comment also about some experiments at some point, especially in the last uh, couple of lectures. So uh, this is the syllabus. This is more or less what I wanted to, to cover. I don't know if I will cover everything and, <clears throat> and I'm not sure how much detail I will go, especially at the end. Um, so in the first two lectures, so this will be today and tomorrow, I will discuss the very basics of ultra cold gases going, uh, focusing specifically on the issue of Bose-Einstein Bose condensation. So we will, start with ideal gases, introduce interactions, and go basically all the way in the theory of Bose-Einstein condensate. So this will take us, I think, a couple of days, perhaps a little bit less. And then in the last uh, two lectures, I will discuss um, the uh, physics of atoms in optical lattices. This is a physics of astronomical lattices. And so the first thing I would like to discuss is um, where is the, actually the difference between the first part and the second part of the lecture, which is basically given by the fact that here interactions in the second part of the lectures, so these lectures three and four play a much more relevant role. And uh, also correlations, quantum correlations play a much more relevant role. And then I will uh, discuss um, the so-called Bose-Haber model, uh, the simulations of quantum simulation of spin models, and then I will discuss different control possibilities of atoms in optical lattices. And while discussing that, I will introduce some interesting problems, which are right now uh, quite at the forefront of the of research in ultra cold gases. So I will, I will be very brief in this, in this part, just to give you a sort of glimpse of all the, th the things, or some of the things that uh, people is doing. This is a very active field and very broad field, so uh, I cannot go very deep. But, uh, but just to give you an, a, a glimpse of the physics of atoms in, in, in optical lattices. Okay, good. So let's now um, start with, as I say, uh, the, the first lecture, which is the lecture on, on both Einstein condensates. So the first thing that I would like to, to discuss is the very idea of both Einstein condensate, as many of you know, probably from statistical mechanics. So let's consider, so I will consider just the case of bosons, as I say. So if you have bosons, yes, uh, bosons uh, follow the Bose-Einstein statistics, of course. And if I have a look to bosons in free space, so without potential in free space, then the mean occupation uh, of, uh, uh, so the, the single particle levels are um, the levels with, uh, with a given momentum P and they have an energy E P, which is P squared over twice the mass. Yes, this is the, the, the energy, the single particle energy. 
And then the Bose uh, Einstein statistics tells me that the mean occupation of a level with a momentum P is given by this expression of here. Uh, this beta is the inverse temperature, the Boltzmann constant here. Uh, mu is the chemical potential. The chemical potential, yes. And of course, here the, the ground state uh, of single particle ground state is, is, is P equal to zero, right? Which has an energy, of course, zero in, in free space. So this is the, uh, the number of part, the, the, the number of particles at a particular level. If we have a look now to the uh, total number of particles, so this means that we have to sum over all this NP, yes. And now I pass to the continuum. So I, instead of taking the sum, I just integrate. Then I have V, this is the quantization volume. I have H, I should put H instead of H. H. The Planck constant. And then I have this integral here. So I just integrate over all this, um, these occupations. Yes, so this is the, uh, the number of particles, <clears throat> yes. And then if I calculate the density, so the number of particles divided by volume, and then I extract from this integral, basically the, the contribution given by the uh, zero momentum, then I get something of, of this form. So here I introduce the concept of fugacity. So this is E beta mu, this is the fugacity. And then, you have this expression of here. Okay. Between zero and infinity. And what is interesting is that this um, expression of here actually can be written in the following form. It's one divided by a length to the power three. I will, just, I will tell you what this length is. And a given function, which I will tell you right now what this function is, uh, of the fugacity. This lambda t is a length, is the so-called thermal de Broglie wavelength, yes? The thermal de Broglie wavelength uh, is uh, proportional to the inverse square root temperature. Yes, so it's something like this to the power one half. So the lower the temperature, the bigger this thermal de Broglie wavelength. Yes, so this is the thermal de Broglie wavelength. Yes. And this G function here is defined in this way, it's the sum is this is this sum? Okay. What is interesting, and this and this uh, expression, as I say, is the number. So this this here, I will call n zero, is the number of particles in the lowest single particle eigenstate. So in the p equal to zero. Now you see that something quite remarkable happens when z goes to one. Yes. So when the chemical potential goes to zero which is the fact that this N0 tends, so this N0 actually diverges. Yes, so this is already telling to you something. But also it is equally important is the fact that this function of here, this quantity of here is actually bound. So if you have a look to the form of this function, G, three half of Z versus Z between zero and one, then you would see that this function makes something like this. Yes. It is a fixed, it has a maximum. It does not go up from there. And this is 2.612, this maximum. Whereas this here, let's put it with another color, this here diverges when you go to uh, 
to the chemical potential equal to zero. So this means that now let's so this this is as I say this is the density. Yes. So I will write this in this form. This is basically the same expression. And zero is the, the density of particles in the lowest um, state, p equal to zero. Plus, as I say, this g three half of z function. But then I tell you that this is a smaller than 2.612. So this means that if this number of here, which is what is called the phase space density, phase space density, phase space density, if this number surpasses 2.612, right? This means that this is already filled. So you cannot put particles in excited state and all the particles will go just in a single state, which is this lowest state with P equal to zero. And this is the idea of Bose-Einstein condensation. So you condense here, it's the Bose-Einstein condensation. This is the idea of a Bose and state. Now, this condition n lambda t lambda t is this thermal development length is a function of temperature, right? So I can define a critical temperature for a given density such that this is equal to this number, this magic number. Yes, and this gives me some critical temperature, Tc, which with KB here in front is something like this, two, P, two pi h bar square divided by the mass and divided by 2.612 to the power two thirds. Okay, so the point is that this, this is the critical temperature for condensation. Yes, this is the critical temperature for condensation. <clears throat> yes, for typical experiments, uh, and I will comment on that uh, in a moment. The typical densities are extremely low. This means that the critical density, the critical temperature is also extremely low, typically of the order of mm, smaller than the micro Kelvin, lower than the micro Kelvin. So this means that uh, you need to cool these systems uh, extremely efficiently to, to extremely low temperatures or the order of hundreds of nano Kelvin in typical experiments. Yes, so. This uh, is actually an important point of, of this experiment, is actually how to bring these particles to these very low temperatures. But now, if you plot the number of particles in the condensate versus the total number of particles uh, versus temperature, yes, then there is this point critical temperature. This is a one here. And this curve makes something like this. Yes, so below the critical temperature, you start to pile up particles microscopically into this uh, state, and then you get, uh, you get a Bose-Einstein condensate. state. So what are the critical ingredients in, in this discussion? As you see, the, crit the one critical ingredient definitely is the fact that this, uh, the number of particles in the excited states, it can just be as much as this number, this magic number. Uh, whether this is the case or not, it depends on, on, um, on the um, physical problem that we are studying. If we, study, uh, if we are studying a three-dimensional system in free space, then this is indeed the case. But if you study, for example, other systems, like in particular a one-dimensional system, for example, in free space, then this is not anymore um, the case. And therefore, there is, strictly speaking, no condensation. So, whether you have a condensation or not, it depends in particular very much on the density of the states that you have in, this, in, the, in the problem. Okay, so this is the idea of Bose-Einstein condensation, yes? And of course, the idea of Bose-Einstein condensation plays, historically speaking, a very important role in the physics of ultra-cold gases, because it is, it is, there was, of course, a lot of activities before the Bose-Einstein condensation, before BEC, uh, in, the, in, the, in the 80s and 90s, but starting in the mid 90s with the idea of Bose-Einstein condensation, the field basically exploded because the BC offers a lot of uh, possibilities uh, in, in actually in many fields. Then, <clears throat> associated with the idea of Bose-Einstein condensates, 
there is an important idea that I would like to discuss here, which is the idea of off-diagonal long-range order. This is actually an idea which is more general than the idea of BC, yeah? of diagonal long range order. So O, T, L, R, O, yeah? of diagonal long range order. OK, <clears throat> here, in order to understand what this of diagonal long range order is, Yes, we should have a, uh, we should recall the idea of uh, one body density matrix. One body density matrix is a function in two points. So like this type of correlation function. This is the field operator for bosons at point R and for bosons at point R prime, psi dag up psi. Yeah, this is the uh, single particle density matrix. For a non-interacting system, for a non-interacting system, the eigenstates of the, so basically this density matrix is a matrix, right? So I can diagonalize this matrix. And as I say, for a non-interacting system, the eigenstates of this matrix are the single particle eigenstates. So the eigenstates of the single particle Hamilton. So I can write this actually in this form. As I say, this for, for a non-interacting system, these are just the uh, eigen functions of uh, single particles. And this uh, M bar here is the mean occupation, which fulfills, of course, the Bose-Einstein statistics. OK, so for uh, a free gas, so without potential, this uh, problem is translational invariant. So we can um, just say that this just depends on the distance between these two points. It's because it's translational invariant. And, um, and then this, uh, for, for the case of B equal to zero, as I say, in free space, and uh, moreover, these uh, single particle eigenfunctions are the uh, momentum eigenfunctions. So, are functions of this form. Yeah. By the volume. Okay. <clears throat> and then I can calculate this, um, this um, density matrix. And I can do it for t larger than tc and for t smaller than tc. So when there is no condensation and when there's condensation. Okay, let's have a look to the density matrix. Yes. So the density matrix is basically what I have to do is in here, I have to just to take the integral. So I have to, instead of summing, I just integrate over momentum state. So I will have to do something like this. I just write it once here. This is the plane wave, so this is this here. And here I just write the, uh, the mean occupation following the, the Bose-Einstein statistics. And if you take large distances between these two points, so large S, much less than one, yes, then you get E minus P S square over lambda T square with some prefactor Hamilton and the density. So this decays exponentially, and this lambda t is again this thermal de Broglie wavelength. So if t is larger than tc, this single particle density matrix, which is this single particle correlation here, decays exponentially with uh, like, decays like a Gaussian actually with with the distance in the case to zero. If the temperature is smaller than tc, on the contrary, um, I will not do all the calculation again. So again, for very larges, for large distances, this actually decays like a constant, which is actually coming from the condensate. This is the condensate density, plus something which goes like this. Something which goes with the inverse distance, yes? 
So this is a very different evolution of this correlation function. So let me just plot it here. So this is distance and this is this correlation function. Now for, um, this is n, yes. And let's say that this is n zero. For a non-condensed system, for a temperature larger than the critical temperature for a hot system, say, is the case like a Gaussian like this, to zero. On the other hand, the, um, the, for, the, for the condensed case, it basically goes to a constant. So this means that this correlation function asymptotically does not go to zero, but to a constant value. This is the idea of off-diagonal long-range order. Of diagonal long range order. So you have that this correlation uh, does not go to zero, but at infinity it goes to a finite value. And actually, this finite value is the condensate fraction. Yeah, so the condensate uh, density. So this is actually a very important idea, which has applications to other systems, not just to Bosch and condensates. And it actually holds in the presence of interactions as well. <clears throat> yeah, in the presence of interactions. Um, these wave functions, so these wave functions are not the, the single particle wave functions. Yes, and I will come back to this, to, to the point uh, of uh, non-interacting, uh, uh, of interacting systems later on. Uh, and I will revisit this idea of, of diagonal region. So, <clears throat> so this uh, for the moment is just for an ideal gas. We have just discussed what happens in the absence of interaction. So we have introduced the ideas of both sense and condensation and of off-diagonal long-range order. So <clears throat> now we should include interactions. Yes, so we should have a look to what happens in the presence of interactions. First of all, we should learn how to in introduce interactions. I will just mention this very, very briefly. But first of all, let me mention why interactions are, are relevant. Uh, because this may be a little bit surprising, taking into account the incredibly low densities that one has in this type of systems. So uh, typical densities, mass densities in this type of experiments are of the order of, I don't know, for typical experiments, something like 10 to minus eight kilograms per liter. So this means something like eight orders of magnitude more dilute than water. Yes. <clears throat> so. Taking into account how dilute this is, one could think why interactions should play a role. The particles are very far away from each other. But it's also the case that temperatures and hence particle energies are very low, yes? And uh, then uh, even for these very low densities, interactions actually play an important and actually even a crucial role in the physics of uh, ultra cold uh, gases. And this is the reason why we need to introduce interactions. And nevertheless, the particles are still far away from each other. So we can forget about collisions of more than two particles at the same time. So we will re restrict ourselves to binary collisions. And binary collisions can be described easily. Binary collisions can be described easily <clears throat> in the center of mass uh, reference frame. It's a two body problem, right? So you have something like, uh, like this. This is the potential of interaction, which we assume a, a central potential. So we have to solve this type of uh, Schrodinger equations. And typically, the, the potentials of interaction, this Vr versus R, are something like, like this. So something that decays like 1 over R to the power 6 negative K. Yeah, so it, it decays pretty fast with distance between the particles. So then I can do uh, what is called a partial wave decomposition, which probably many of you have seen already in the, in the, in the class in the, in the university. So I introduce uh, partial waves with different uh, angular momentum L, right? So introduce the, the composition in, in, uh, in, uh, in partial waves. So this means that psi r can be written as the sum over different angular momenta of something like this, some radial function, and the Legendre polynomial here. 
<clears throat> and then what you get is something of the following form for this. This is this equation. And I would like to write this equation explicitly in order to discuss one, one important point. Okay, so this is the Ryle equation for this uh, function here. And here you see the appearance of this term of here, which is nothing else than the centrifugal barrier. The centrifugal barrier. So this means that uh, the uh, atoms in, in the relative coordinate, instead of seeing this potential that they plotted here, they see something like this rather. And there's this barrier here introduced by of the form one over r squared. Yes, you see that this barrier is there for all L different than zero. Now, if the energy of these incoming particles is very low, say here, this means that they never penetrate to this inner core and they don't see the interactions. So this means that for low energies, for low energies, only L equals zero, which is called the S wave the scattering, yes, plays an important role. <clears throat> and this is very fortunate because this means that you cannot, you don't need to know the whole system, but you just need to know actually one parameter. Because in L, in, uh, in S wave, the scattering amplitude is basically minus this number, which is a length, which is the scattering length. The scattering length. And the scattering length is actually playing a very, very important role in the discussion that I will uh, tell you uh, now. So uh, <clears throat> actually asymptotically, this uh, function x k is zero, so for l equal to zero, goes basically like one minus r, except for some prefactor, r a, when r is large. So asymptotically. So basically, if your potential is like this, your wave function looks like this. Yes. So this is this as this is basically this. I am plotting here this C k is zero. And here you see that this asymptotically goes to this line here, which cuts this at some point here. This is the scattering length. Yes, this is radius. And actually, you see that this cut can happen also in negative values, right? So you can have something like this. And then you can have something like, let's say like this, where your cut is actually happening in here. This here is positive and this here is negative. So the scattering length can be positive or negative. And this is important <clears throat> because whether the scattering length is positive or negative will actually determine whether the interactions are repulsive or attractive. The reason why this is attractive or repulsive is that because if you take uh, a potential without bound state, so you take, for example, a barrier here, yes, suppose that you take a, a, bar a barrier potential, then obviously this is already of this form, something like that. So here the scattering length is obviously positive. And if you take uh, a well without bound states, right, then you get something like this for the wave function which is having negative uh, scattering length, yes? So uh, 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 interactions, so basically if the scattering length is positive, you have a repulsive interactions, you have uh, scattering length negative, you have attractive interactions. And indeed, this is the only parameter that you need to know of this potential. So now what you can do is something very interesting. You can substitute your, your potential, which is perhaps very complicated, this type of potential like this, which is perhaps very complicated, and you substitute it by something which is a delta function. Yes, you substitute it by a delta function in the origin such that the scattering length is the same. Yes, so you substitute the potential VR by a pseudo potential of this form. And a delta function here. This is a contact potential. We will call uh, later on this just G. Yes. 
Okay, <clears throat> so this means that now you can substitute this, uh, this potential by a contact potential. <clears throat> and this uh, simplifies my life enormously because I don't need to describe the, the, the system, the, the interactions with all uh, uh, details. I just need one number, which is the scattering net. Interestingly, in experiments, and I just wanted to comment this, you can actually modify the, uh, the value of the scattering length, right? Using what is called a scattering resonance, scattering resonance, which is typically done by uh, means of magnetic fields. I, I cannot enter into that, but just for those of you interested, it's called Feschbach resonance, Feschbach resonance. And basically, what it amounts is for the fact that uh, by changing the magnetic field, you can find uh, critical magnetic fields like this, where your scattering length actually makes something like this. Typical behaviors are something like this. Yes. So you can go from a positive value to a negative value. To, you can cross zero. You can go to infinity or to minus infinity. Yes. Which is the same infinity or minus infinity. So <clears throat> then, uh, and this actually plays a very important role in the physics of, uh, of ultra cold gases the fact that you can actually modify the scattering length. Okay. <clears throat> so now we have introduced the interactions. <clears throat> yes. Uh, by means, uh, basically, we have seen that we just need one number, which is the scattering length, to describe interactions, and we and with that we can use the idea of pseudo protection. So now that we can do, that we know how to introduce the interactions, <clears throat> now we can come back to the interacting problem. Yes, to the interacting bosecars. And this, uh, I, I am still in free space. Yes, we will see later on what happens if we have a trap. This I can describe in second quantization in the following form. So I have first the uh, fact of the kinetic energy. These are the the bosonic operators. <clears throat> And then I have an interaction term of the following form. And I will write it first of all in a, in a general way. Okay, so this is the Hamiltonian with a binary collision here in <coughs> in uh, second quantization using the, the bosonic field operators. So the, these field operators commute, follow the commutation rules of bosonic operator. But now this, this potential of here is the interaction potential, which I can substitute, as I say, by a uh, delta function and a prefactor in here. <clears throat> so this means that now I can substitute uh, I can write this, uh, this uh, equation, this Hamiltonian, the kinetic energy remains the same. But how, now, now here I have something much simpler. <clears throat> okay, so this is the uh, field operator, the, 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 sorry, the Hamiltonian in terms of the field operator. <clears throat> and now I can uh, pass to momentum space, yes? So let me discuss this in momentum space. This is the best way of, of describing this problem because I am actually at, uh, with no potential, yes? So the right actually uh, quantum number is actually the momentum, right? Because this is a translation invariant system. So now I Fourier transform here. Yeah, so I introduced the, the bosonic operators for uh, creation and annihilation of particles with a momentum P. And then I can write my Hamiltonian in this one. 
So this is the kinetic energy, which now is very simple. Okay, <clears throat> so this is my Hamiltonian. And now note that here, I destroy particles with P1 and P2 and create particles with P2 minus Q and P1 plus Q. So this means that the total momentum is preserved. This is because I am in a translational invariant system, a momentum, total momentum is of course a conserved quantity. So <clears throat> this is the Hamiltonian that describes an interacting Bose system in uh, in free space, but now I know something else. I am interested now in the situation of what happens when the temperature is much smaller than the critical temperature. So this means that uh, in this system, uh, the uh, zero momentum will be macroscopically populated. Yes, so this means that at P equal to zero, the number of particles in this lowest moment, in this lowest uh, state uh, is uh, comparable to the total number of particles, whereas the number of particles in excited state is much smaller. And then I can introduce an approximation now here. Yes, I can introduce an approximation, which is the following. In principle, these are operators, but as I say, N0 is very, very large. So this means that now I can approximate this basically by the square root of N0. Yes, you can see easily how, why is this? Because if you take A0, and you apply it over the condensate N0, number of particles in, the, in this, you get something like a square root of N0, N0 minus one, yes? But one is very, very small, yes? So you can forget about, uh, compared to N0, N0 minus one is basically N0, and then, uh, and the same for A0 uh, dagger, right? So this means that we can substitute this by C numbers and not by operators, so this is the square root of N0. Okay, and now let me uh, let me tell you what I what is my plan now with this <coughs> with this equation and and why I want to go to this. What we will see right now as a result of the following calculation <coughs> is <coughs> that uh, is what we will obtain is basically the condensate, yes, and we will have a look to the excitations on top of the condensate. So basically, we have the condensate, right, and in addition to this condensate, there are excitations, yeah, which can be just quantum uh, fluctuations that they have in my system. So I just populate excitations quantumly, or I can have tem some temperature effects which will populate these excitations, yes. And then we will have a, a look to the nature of these excitations, yes. We will see that these excitations are actually what is called a quasi particle, and we will have a look to this, uh, the energy associated to these quasi particles. We will see that these quasi particles have a defined momentum, but they, uh, the relation between energy and momentum, so what is called the dispersion, is not the typical one that you have for uh, particles, which is P squared uh, divided by 2m, but something else. And this something else will play a very important role in the theory of, uh, of Bose Einstein, uh, Bose -Einstein composites. Okay, so uh, Regis, should we do a, a, a break for questions now or how? Do we... Yeah, I think probably if, uh, we can uh, uh, do a break. So if anybody wants to uh, ask any questions, you can ask uh, now, okay. Uh, until the topic which is covered now. Is there any question from the audience? Yeah, yeah so from uh, the last point, I have a question. So, uh, so when you approximate the potential by the delta kind of approximate the uh, potential by pseudo potential, which is a delta kind of potential, so by uh, that scattering length, that parameter uh, parameterized by the scattering length, and then uh, it, it should be positive or uh, negative means attractive or repulsive according to the sign of A, right? Yes. Uh, so then uh, when you again uh, go to the second quantized form and take that the ground state uh, is the Bose-Einstein condensate 
that state. So for repulsive and attractive in both cases, that approximation holds like, uh, is it fine that for attractive also, we should go for, start from Bose-Einstein uh, Bose condensate and repulsive also, it should be Bose-Einstein condensate or it should differ because of the potential. That, that, uh, that's, a good, that's a good point. Actually, this I, I didn't mention. In, in this calculation uh, concerning interacting positive gases, I will just discuss the case of G positive. Okay. Yes. Okay. In principle, you can use the same formalism for G negative. Yes. But you will see that if you have G negative, then you will have a problem, which okay. is the fact that uh, here I am assuming that for temperature much smaller than uh, T critical, the condensate is at P equal to zero. This is true because I have G positive. When G is negative, right? What I yes. have is an attraction, yes? Yes, yes? So this means that the particles minimize the energy by increasing density, yes? In principle, increasing density will uh, be, in principle, cool, one cool thing that this can be counterrest by the increase of kinetic energy, just because when you increase density, you are also increasing the curvature basically of the density, which is basically what this is telling. But so basically you, your particles start to increase kinetic energy, but uh, in three dimensional systems, the interactions always win and uh, your system will eventually collapse. So mm. when G is negative, the system collapses. You need a trap actually to stabilize the system for a, for a given a small, uh, sufficiently small number of particles. Uh, in free space, there is no stable condensate with G negative. Okay. And if we go in uh, like lower dimension, like 2D with this kind of dispersion at equals to zero, we can have a condensation, right? Finite temperature condensation is not possible, but uh, exactly. so, yeah. but yeah, so they are, uh, they are, this system behaves like in the same way uh, if we deal with uh, uh, attractive or repulsive, both kind of potential system collapses. Yes, or? yes. Uh, in, in 2D, in 2D, it uh, either collapses or expands without, uh, without limits. So basically there is no uh, possibility of condensation either with G negative. In, uh, in 1D, there is, strictly speaking, there is no condensation. <clears throat> yeah. because, because of what I was mentioning at the very beginning, in 1D, this integral of here actually diverges. It's yeah. not bounded, right, yeah. Okay. okay, if any, if, is there any other question? If no other question, I think Luis can continue and we take more questions in the end. Okay. So I have one uh, question. Hello? Uh, yeah. So uh, when you are discussing about uh, off diagonal long distance order, then you are saying large distance RS, right? So that large. Like, what do you mean by large? Means, and, yeah, or, yeah. So when you're saying large edge compared to something else, so that actually part I did not understand. So I'm, I'm think, yes, I'm thinking in terms of... No? I am thinking in terms, for example, of the thermal development we plan. So it's something very far away. But but here, something which I wanted to mention also. Sorry, can, can you switch off the mic, the microphone? Because otherwise, there is a big, a big echo. Okay, the, something which is interesting, which, which I should mention here already, is that this decays for a sufficiently large S, as I tell you, and this is comparable to this term at the length. But my point here, it is more, so basically the point is that I am having a system which is sufficiently large such that I see this decay. Now, if I, my system is small enough such that I am not able to see this decay, yes, because due to finite size, and this, and as I will, as I will mention right now, experiments are in trap systems which have a finite size. This means that I can mimic in my system because I simply don't allow my system to decay uh, towards zero, this off diagonal range order. I can mimic a sort of uh, off diagonal long range order in this uh, small system because this simply does not decay enough in my system. 
And this is important because at some point, I don't know if I will mention this here or not, but you will listen. Things like, for example, when people talk about one dimensional condensates and this sort of stuff. But the, the, what is meant here is that the size of the system is enough, small enough, such that one does not see this, uh, this decay. But if you have a one dimensional system and you take a system which is bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger in the, this one dimension, right? Then at some point, you will see that the system is not truly a condensate. Yes, it's more what the people call a quasi condensate. <clears throat> but okay, you yeah. will perhaps that uh, at some point people talking about one dimensional condensates, even myself, I talk about this, but this is what one has in mind. Yes. Okay, uh, so if no questions, we can continue. Yeah. One small question. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, so regarding the last uh, assumption, last answer that A0 and A0 dagger can be assumed as square root not. Why don't we make this assumption for p equal to one or p equal to two states also? And when is Sorry. this assumption valid? When it... Where? Sorry. So in the last statement, when you have written a zero and a zero dagger are approximated as complex numbers, why can't we assume a one and a one dagger as a one dagger as a complex number also? And but the condensation is just in one state. Pardon. The condensation is just in one state. The other states have a number of particles of the order of one, much smaller than, than the number of particles, the total number of particles. It is just one mode, which is, let's say, singular, which is, which is uh, macroscopically populated. The other modes are not macroscopically populated. Okay? So A0, so meaning A of P equal to zero, is the one which is macroscopically populated. But, but is this is it correct for us to actually approximate a, a field operator an operator as a scalar because yes just because of this reason that, that I just mentioned this one because n zero is is uh, is very very big so what is the difference between n zero and n zero plus one when n zero is one million yes that's my point okay. Good. So let, let me just go on with, with this, which is, and then I will do the following. So as I say, I want to study excitations on top of the, uh, of the condensate. So we will then expand this Hamiltonian. We will do a perturbation theory. So we will expand in powers of these operators, A, P, different than zero and AP dagger different than zero. Yes, we will span in powers of this. Then you see that uh, zero order is just putting everything, just the zeros, right? Uh, in first order, there is just one operator which is non-zero and the others are zero, but this is never occurring, yes? You see that, for example, if this is zero, then the other ones uh, sorry, if, if this is zero, this is zero, and this is zero, this has to be necessarily zero as well, yes? So I cannot have just one operator. So the lowest uh, terms that I have is actually terms which have two operators, which, are, which have a p different than zero. So if you do the math and you go to second order, then you see that this Hamiltonian up to second order is then of the following form. This is already second order. Then I have the contribution coming from the um, zero order, which is this one. And then I have a contribution coming from the second order, which is this one. Okay, <clears throat> so this is, if you do the math, you will see that this is what you, uh, what you get. Now, the total number of particles is the number of particles in the condensate plus the number of particles which are not in the condensate. Yes, 
So if you take the square of this, you take the square here, then you get something of the form n square. And now I take just the, the, the second order. Yes. <clears throat> Actually, here I could just simply write n because higher order because uh, if the difference between putting n zero putting n here will give me just higher order uh, terms. So this means that I can just substitute uh, n zero square plus two a p here as uh, n square. If you do that. Yes, so if you, if you use this, this trick, then you can write the upper Hamiltonian in the following form. We will not do all the details, but I think that you can reproduce this easily. Now I have n squared and not n zero squared here. And here you have a two instead of a four because a two you have already eaten in the definition of n squared here. Okay, so this is the uh, so this is the Hamiltonian, and now you see that in this Hamiltonian we have terms which are should be familiar to us from the theory of harmonic oscillator terms of this form, a p dagger a p, which is just the number uh, operator for the uh, momentum p. And then you have this type of terms, dagger, dagger, not dagger, not dagger, which are less common. Yes. When you have a Hamiltonian of this form, in this theory and in any other theory that you can meet, yes, then you always perform something which is called a Bogolyubov transformation. Bogolyubov transformation. Basically, just, just to mention something already at this point, the fact that you have these terms which are creating particles and these terms which are destroying two particles, these terms, this term here and this term here preserve the number of particles. But this term here and this term here does not preserve, do not preserve the number of particles. This means that, that uh, the concept of particle is going to be worse defined now here. Okay, we will now try to see this in a more rigorous way. So as I say, you introduce something which is called a Bogolyubov transformation, which is the following. You introduce two bosonic fields, two bosonic operators with a, with a fixed defined momentum, B, uh, P and BP uh, dagger, such that you rewrite this Yes, and this, so these are, so you write the uh, particle operators in, in terms of these other bosonic operators that we have here. And now we impose indeed that these operators, these B operators, fulfill the bosonic, uh, anti the bosonic commutation rules, sorry. And uh, this means that uh, u p square minus v p square must be equal to one. This is what you get directly when you uh, impose this condition. Yes, <clears throat> so indeed one can see that uh, u p is equal to u minus p or v p is equal to u v minus p, so it doesn't matter whether it is plus or minus. And indeed due to this relation, due to the fact that cosinus hyperbolicus squared minus sinus hyperbolicus squared is one. This means that we can actually write up and u minus p as the cosinus hyperbolicus square of some number. And uh, you, we can write vp and v minus p as the sinus hyperbolicus square of some number. Sorry, sinus, not sinus hyperbolicus. A square, but sinus and cosinus. Okay. <clears throat> so we introduce now this transformation 
here, this Bogolyubov transformation, and we plug this into this Hamiltonian. If you do that and you do the math, right, then you get the following Hamiltonian now. And I will try to, to so you apply this and apply the commutation rules and everything. So you get this Hamiltonian. This was the zero order. So this is basically this term, which is uh, here. And uh, <clears throat> then you have this term. Okay. Okay, almost ready. Okay, <clears throat> and now you see something interesting here. In principle, I did not tell you still what this alpha p is. It's a, something which I can do it for the moment is free, right? But what I will use is this freedom to put this to zero. So basically I want that this is zero. So this means that I remove these terms with daggers, two daggers and two not daggers. And I just retain terms of this form or constant terms like this one. Yes. And this introduces a, a, a condition. Yes, and this condition tells me that this is like this. T squared to n plus n. So basically if I put, this is the condition for this alpha p, the tangent hyperbolic of two alpha p is like this. And when I do this, then I cancel this term of here, yes. And uh, then I just get terms with VP dagger and, 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 and constant terms. And then I can write my Hamiltonian in a final form by doing this transformation, which I will just write in the final form. I will mention, I, I will say what this C function is. Okay, so what do we have here? <clears throat> so, first of all, you have this constant term in here. I will come back to this point in a second. Yes, <clears throat> this is constant. Constant in the sense that it does not depend on the uh, creation or annihilation operators of the uh, of this uh, uh, BP. <clears throat> yes. And then I have this term of here, which is the traditional standard term, which looks like a harmonic oscillator, right? <clears throat> so basically what we have here is excitations, which have a defined momentum P and a defined uh, energy associated with this momentum P, which is the dispersion, yes? These particles, however, they are not part, these excitations, however, they are not particles, but rather quasi-particles. And this, we can see it immediately from this definition. 
because creating a particle or destroying a particle, for example, in here, destroys a, uh, this excitation, but also creates an excitation here. So this means that we cannot associate this excitation to particles, but actually is what is called a quasi-particle. Quasi-particle. Yes. These quasi-particles have defined momentum and a defined energy. Yes. And this energy is given by this expression of here. So this energy depends on momentum and depends on interactions through this time of here. This is what is called the Bogoliubov spectrum. Now I will come back now to this Bogoliubov spectrum. Bogoliubov spectrum. Yes. So now, <clears throat> this is a very important result, actually. Uh, the fact that we can see now the excitations on top of our condensate as excitations with a fixed, uh, with a given uh, defined momentum and a given uh, relation between energy and momentum. Now, in absence of quasi particles, so when the number of quasi particles is zero, yes, we have still, still, a, uh, so at zero temperature, we will have still something which is not exactly the, uh, the situation that we had without. Uh, interactions. So let's let let me be concrete about that. So what happens if we have no interactions? If we have no interactions, so if g is equal to zero, this means no interactions. Then this Cp is p square over two n. Then you can see it directly from here. Then you can see that then this quantity of here is equal to this quantity of here. This is zero, and this means that this this whole term here is zero. So then you just have this term of here, yes, which is just the energy of the condensate without interactions. <clears throat> so here excitations play no role in the energy uh, of, the, uh, of the condensate. But if there are interactions, excitations do play a role in the, in the energy of the condensate, even if they are not populated. So th there is a quantum zero point energy uh, of the uh, excitations, right? <clears throat> so this means that the energy of the uh, of the condensate is not just this um, zero energy that we will have in absence of uh, interactions, but there is actually a shift. Yes, so the energy, it has a, sh a shift, even at zero temperature, even at zero temperature. Yes, the energy has a shift. And this shift is what is called the Li Wan Yang correction. Yes. And it's precisely this term which is here. Yes. And if one does this, uh, one calculates this, uh, this term, actually, one gets something like this. Okay, so this is the Li Wan Yang correction. And this number, we have to compare this number with this number of here, with the energy of the, of the condensate. And this is why I wrote it in this way, because basically we have here already E0. This number, which is here, yes, is typically something very, very, very small in experiments because the density is very small, such that Na cube is very small. Density times the scattering length to the power three is very small. So this is what is called the diluteness parameter, and this is assumed to be very small. Yes. So typically this correction is very small, but when interactions increase, right, then this number can become observable and has been indeed observed. Yes. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> the other important uh, thing that I would like to mention related to these uh, quantum corrections is that if you have a look now, <clears throat> to the number of particles in the system, then you get the number of particles N0 plus the number of particles in uh, excited uh, states, yes? But now, as I told you, the, the, the particle and the quasi-particle is not the same, yes? This you can write in terms of quasi-particles, yes? So now you can write AP 
in terms of this VP and BP uh, dagger, right? And then you will see that even at zero temperature, at zero temperature, you get an uh, extra contribution, which is this VP that we introduced before in the volume of transformation. So this means that the number of particles in the condensate and zero, contrary to the, uh, the non-interacting case, if you remember at zero temperature in the non-interacting case for non-interactions, at zero temperature, you remember this graph that I was pl plotting to you before, you got 100% of all the, uh, all the particles in the condensate. With interactions, this is not anymore the case because of this effect of uh, what is called quantum depletion. Quantum depletion. Depletion. The depletion. Yes. <clears throat> and indeed, this number, uh, the number of particles in the condensate is the total number. And if one does the math, one gets something like this. It's also depending on this diluteness parameter that I was introducing to you before. <clears throat> Again, if the, uh, for many experiments, this is a very small number, but it's something which can be seen if the interactions uh, start to increase. And indeed here you start to see a glimpse of something which is important and which will play a very important role later on, which is the fact that if interactions start to be very important, so if this diluteness parameter is not anymore small, then you will start to get higher and higher quantum depletion. And at some point, the very idea of condensation starts to be uh, doubtful, right? And, uh, and the, basically the, all the methodology that we are going to develop now to treat uh, both Einstein condensates start to be uh, doubtful and one has to introduce some of them, which, which we will discuss for the case of lattices in the, in the third and fourth lecture. So <clears throat> the volume of a spectrum has very important consequences for the physics of, uh, of, um, of uh, ultra cold bosons. So let me just discuss one second about the uh, volume of a spectrum. Volume of a spectrum. I write it here again. Okay, <clears throat> and here let's try to plot this Bogoli of spectrum as a function of P and as a function, and here we have the energy. So this function looks like this. There is, so it looks like this. For low momentum, for low momentum here, for low momentum, this is proportional to P. This is very simple to see because for low momentum, uh, this part of here is much smaller than this part of here. So I assume that for low momentum means P squared over 2M is much smaller than 2GN. Then you can uh, immediately see that uh, this uh, goes like something like a constant, which is the, which plays here the role of sound velocity times P. This is the sound velocity is called and this is the square root of g n divided by m. So this means that this spectrum, this, uh, this uh, energy goes linearly with momentum. This is why this part is called the phonon part of the spectrum, because this is similar to the dispersion of phonons. Actually, it's also, also the photons have this dispersion, no? but in the literature, this is called the phonon part of the spectrum. So these excitations are phonons. Um, for P squared over 2M, much larger than 2GN on the contrary. Now, this part of here is much smaller than this part of here. And then you can see that we recover the uh, dispersion of a single particle. So here, this is proportional to P squared. So this is what one could call the single particle part of the spectrum. So for large momenta, you recover basically the dispersion of a single particle. So basically quasi particles becomes particles. Whereas if you are at low momentum, quasi particles are very different than particles. And indeed you get now a dispersion, which is linear. This is this uh, phonon part of the spectrum. The part, the, the fact that the um, dispersion has a, a, a linear dependence at low momentum is extremely important, yes, 
because it's directly related with an idea which is very uh, important, of course, which is the idea of superfluidity, which you have probably heard many times. Yes, the idea of superfluidity. The idea of superfluidity is directly linked with the fact that there is a linear part in the spectrum. So in order to understand why the idea of superfluidity is directly linked to that, we are going to follow a way of reasoning which was introduced by Lev Landau in the 40s of the last century, which is the following. <clears throat> Suppose that you have a fluid which is flowing through a capillary, say, with some velocity, which I will call V. Yes, this is a capillary, so these are, these are the walls of the capillary and the flow is flowing in here. What does it mean to say that the system is experiencing viscosity? Viscosity means that there are some excitations here that I am creating some excitations which are going against the flow. Yes, so I start to dump the flow by creating elementary excitations against the uh, flow. Yes. So <clears throat> let's have a look now to this problem. Instead of working in the lab frame first, let's move now to the frame of reference of the fluid. So now the fluid is at rest. Yes, and the walls are actually moving now. But the fluid is here at rest. Yes, so at rest, I will have some energy zero, which will be the energy of the ground state, which have any excitation in the system. Yes, and then I will have some, some momentum P zero, which will be zero, because I am in the reference frame of the fluid at rest. Yes. And now let's consider what is going to be the effect here of having excitations in this system. Yes, which, are, which is the effect of having excitations in this system. Yes, when I have an excitation, I will have some quasi particle with momentum P, which is the same as what we just discussed, some excitation with a momentum P and some energy associated with energy EP. So this means that the energy now is going to be E zero plus the energy of this excitation and the momentum is going to be just the momentum of this uh, excitation. So, so the total momentum is just the momentum of this excitation that we, have, that we have created because at the beginning there was no excitation. Okay, so this is in the frame of reference of the fluid. Now let's come back to the lab. Yes, we come back to the lab reference frame. And then here we have to do the Galilean transformation. So basically the momentum P prime is the momentum P, which is the momentum of the excitation, plus the mass of the fluid times the velocity of the fluid. Yes. And the energy is uh, this energy zero plus <coughs> uh, the energy of this uh, was a particle, which we just said, and then we have to put the uh, kinetic energy associated to the um, to the whole um, fluid plus the Doppler effect, yes, associated to that. Yeah, so this is what Galilean Galilean transformation tells me that they have to do. So because I have an excitation which have, with, which have momentum p. So what is the difference for the in the lab frame? Now in the lab frame. Without excitation, without excitation, I had an energy which is E0 plus mv squared divided by 2. Now, with excitation, I have this energy without excitation, but then I have some extra term here, which is this. Uh, dispersion plus the Doppler effect. So this is the energy that the system gains, delta E, when it creates an excitation. And now why I want to go to this point. What I, would, what I, want, to, I want to go to this point because I will just create spontaneously these uh, excitations which are going to be the responsible of the viscosity in my system, right? We should not forget that I want to see this, I am seeing this excitation as the reason of the viscosity in the system, right? But in order to have this excitation, I have to create them, and I just create them spontaneously if this delta E is smaller than zero. 
So if I reduce energy by creating them. And now the question is whether this is the case, right? Now, <clears throat> the best case in order to have delta E smaller than zero is such that this number of here is actually that P is anti-parallel, anti-parallel to V, such that P times V is minus PV, yes? Because in this way, I get the directly a minus sign here in front. So I get something like this. And now I ask myself whether this can be smaller than zero. So this means that V has to be larger than this number. Okay. <clears throat> so if V is larger than this number, this means, so if the, if the fluid velocity is larger than this critical number, this means that I can create spontaneously excitations with a momentum P. But <clears throat> what happens if I define now this number, which I will call the minimal overall P of this number? Yes. And this number is now different than zero. This means that if now the velocity is smaller than this critical number, then this means that I, can, I can't create actually any excitation spontaneously. Yes? No spontaneous creation of excitations. And therefore, no viscosity. Ergo, superfluidity. Yes? This is what is called the Landau criterion. Landau criterion. And now let's see why this is relevant. <clears throat> yes? Let's plot again the Bogolubov spectrum. Yes. Now you can see immediately that this critical velocity is nothing else than this. Because basically the critical velocity, this CP over P, is if you take uh, a core here, it's just linking. You take, for example, this P and this EP is the, the, uh, the slope of this, of this line. And you are looking for the minimal slope. And the minimal slope is, of course, in this case, this, this tangent core, this tangent line. Here. So this means that the critical velocity, I recall you that in the volume of the spectrum, this is the sound velocity times P. So this means that the critical, the critical velocity is the sound velocity. Yes. Now, note something very important. The sound velocity, I wrote you here, the sound velocity depends on interactions. So if the interactions are zero, the sound velocity is zero. So if, but if the interactions are zero and the sound velocity is zero, this means that the critical velocity for superfluidity will be zero. So this means that interactions are crucial in order to have superfluidity. If there are no interactions, you can have a condensate, but you will not have superfluid. <clears throat> Yeah. Now, in, uh, in helium, the situation is a little bit different, right? It's not the same as for, for the condenses that you have in experiments with ultra cold gases. Uh, because in helium, in superfluid helium, the, uh, the spectrum actually looks rather like this. Yes, this is what is called the roton, the roton minimum. And here you see that if you apply the Landau criterion, this here is the sound velocity, but the Landau criterion tells me that the critical, super, the critical velocity for superfluidity is this one. Yes. So the critical, superfluid, the critical super velocity for superfluidity is actually smaller than the uh, sound velocity, and significantly smaller, maybe. Yes, this is. Uh, the case of helium. 
Okay, <clears throat> so we have seen <clears throat> now that, uh, that, so basically what we have done now uh, is that we have found, so first of all, we have started with the, uh, the Hamiltonian for uh, um, in second quantization with the, with the field operators. We have moved to momentum space. We have applied this Bogolyubov transformation, this Bogolyubov approximation. So basically we have approximated the zero fields here by a C number. And we have expanded up to second order uh, and obtained this Hamiltonian here. Then we do the Bogolyubov transformation and we obtain uh, a Hamiltonian like this one. <clears throat> and uh, we have seen that, first of all, this constant part gives me this uh, quantum uh, energy correction and the quantum depletion. And this second part here, which depends on the population of uh, quasi-particles, is uh, given, is, is telling to me that these quasi-particles have a defined momentum and a defined energy, which is given by the volume of the spectrum. And then we show that the volume of the spectrum is, uh, has this phonon part and this uh, single particle part. And the phonon part is absolutely crucial for, uh, for the idea of, uh, of superheat. So up to now, <clears throat> we have considered that the, um, <clears throat> the, um, the uh, so that we had no uh, confinement. So up to now, we had no uh, external potential. But uh, this is actually quite unrealistic because in typical experiments, actually in all experiments, you have a, you have a trap. Yes. So basically, you have uh, your system, and this system is confined by by lasers, by magnetic fields, or by a combination of lasers and magnetic fields, right? And uh, in a sense, you can understand this uh, this condensate as living in a to a very large extent in, in a harmonic potential. So basically, in a three dimensional harmonic uh, potential. Now the question is. <clears throat> What, how do I describe now uh, a condensate which has not a fixed density n everywhere, but which will have now a, uh, a distribution in space? Yes. Yes. So this is <clears throat> what um, we will discuss uh, tomorrow. Yes. We will have a look to, to how to describe uh, um, a condensate which has uh, a spatial dependence. Yes, we will introduce the idea of uh, order parameters, so the idea of the wave function of the condensate. The, uh, in, an important equation, which is the, 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 the gross pitayesk equation, right? <clears throat> and then I will, uh, I will discuss important concepts uh, of the theory of uh, Bose-Einstein condensates, in particular, the idea of the phase of the, uh, of the wave function, the idea of the dynamic equations, and, uh, and then the important idea of the relation between superfluidity, which we just discussed, and uh, Boston state condensation, and uh, some, uh, some important consequences of superfluidity, with, uh, like, the, uh, like the idea of quantized vortices. Okay, so, but this we will do uh, tomorrow. Now, if you want, we can have some further questions. Okay, now actually it's open for questions. So anybody who wants to ask questions, please go ahead. Uh, I had a question. Mm -hmm. Hello, I'm audible. Am I audible? Yes. Uh, so exactly in this graph. So uh, so looking at it, I had some speculations regarding. Uh, so when I look at it, it seems that this uh, what you said that VC less than CS, and it will give rise to superfluidity because uh, the sound speed will always be greater than the critical speed. But this is valid only for uh, the population, uh, the excitation, the pop uh, like. Uh, excuse, uh, sorry the contribution in the excitations from the roton part, right? Not from right. all of it. So is that the reason why we have a superfluid fraction and not uh, total superfluidity? Well, in a sense, you destroy superfluidity. You destroy the very, the very effect of superfluidity by populating rotons in the system, right? Because basically what happens 
if you if you see what happens when you put when you add to this the term when you subtract minus pd right what in reality is you are doing is, is like tilting the whole graph you are rotating the whole graph like this right so instead of having something like this you have actually something more like this yes so this means that now the uh, so basically what i am doing here is to subtract minus pv in this graph so basically what you are doing is, is right so you destroy the superfluid flow by creation by creating rotons by creating excitations but since you are touching here zero and actually going even below zeros this means that now the number of rotons in your system the number of rotons will grow exponentially in time yes grows exponentially in time mm -hmm. because they have an imaginary energy so perhaps i can i can men mention this in more detail so uh, if this touches zero and even goes below zero right this means that the energy of the roton becomes something like minus e and some real number right so this means that now when you write e minus e roton plus let's say roton uh, t over h1 then you get something like e plus e t over h1 so this means that now this grows exponentially <clears throat> So this means that you grow more and more and more and more and more and more, and eventually you destroy the condensate. You destroy the you destroy the <clears throat> you destroy the superfluidity flow, right? You destroy superfluidity. <clears throat> yeah. Oh. Now, <clears throat> one thing which I, do, I did not mention because I cannot enter into this uh, theory <clears throat> is, of course, what is the effect of temperature that you have here? Because <clears throat> uh, perhaps some of you have heard that there is a theory which is called the two fluid theory basically which tells me that the uh, if i have a look to the mass density it has two components one part is the superfluid density and the other part is which is called the normal density which depends on temperature yes and when temperature goes to zero yes this goes to zero yes and then you get a a, a superfluid a full 100 uh, percent superfluid <clears throat> right but of course you can destroy always this superfluid flow by uh, flowing uh, larger than the, than the critical, than the critical uh, velocity right <clears throat> of course if you increase temperature more and more and more and more then at some point you also destroy completely the superfluid because then the normal part would be bigger and bigger and bigger more questions uh, no no thanks yeah so any other question yeah uh, so from the non uniformity of ordered parameter i i don't want to ask any details but one thing that uh, this is a complex ordered parameter right so it has an amplitude part and also the phase part in yes. the like and the goldstone kind of contribution comes from the phase part right so when are you saying that uh, we are going to consider the non-uniform order parameter? Are you going to say that the uh, phase part you are going to do the fluctuations because that part is uh, like massless kind of thing and you can do the small fluctuation and it will contribute to low energy theory. But the uh, amplitude part will contribute to high, uh, means mass massive and high energy part. So it, it should not contribute to the low energy physics, right? So the, that part and confused that uh, non-uniform means what we will going to uh, vary yes. the amplitude or the phase kind of thing. Yes, I, I will mention about both the amplitude and the phase, but especially about the phase. Okay. <clears throat> because the phase is particularly important. The phase of the condensate is basically the 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 link between the idea of superfluidity and, and both system condensation, we will see that the gradient of this phase is related, is, base, is basically directly given the, the superfluid velocity. <clears throat> yes. And it's, we will see also that the phase is uh, defined up to a constant. So, uh, and associated with this uh, gauge invariance, there is the Goldstone mode and so on. But I will not mention too much about the Goldstone mode. Okay. Uh, so more questions. If anyone has, uh, please go Hello. ahead and ask in the uh, 
mic uh, hello sir yes yeah, so i have a question like uh, where does the lhy correction originates and when is it relevant in the system sorry much more uh, so the lhy correction where does it uh, originates and where is it uh, when is it relevant in the system you mean which correction sorry the uh, lhy correction? LH, lhy correction yeah <clears throat> yes the lhy correction comes <clears throat> directly so i did not have the time to go through the calculation in detail <clears throat> but comes from this term of here <clears throat> and this term of here comes from the uh, from the fact that when you introduce this into this here you will get terms which are of the form bp bp dagger yes which of course gives you something like one plus VP dagger VP. So due to the uh, commutation rules, right? This part of here will give you eventually uh, this, uh, these terms, but these ones that you have here due to uh, uh, um, commutation rules will give you, will build up to these constants that you have here. Yeah, comes directly from the, from the quantum character of the problem. So indeed, the LH correction is the quantum correction of the energy. It's basically the fact that it's like the zero point energy of a harmonic oscillator, which is H bar omega half, so to say, this zero point energy, this, this uh, Li Wang Yang correction is basically the zero point energy of the excitation. So even if you don't have excitations, you have some effect of the zero point energy. Yes. <clears throat> and this, as I say, is typically not relevant because the energy associated with the condensate, this part of here, the, which is called the mean field energy, actually, and we will see this in, in more detail in, in the next class, the idea of mean field. This mean field energy is much larger than this energy associated with quantum fluctuations. Now, this is not true if the interactions are strong. And there are also other cases in which, for example, the mean field energy, for some reasons, because you have, for example, the competition of two different interactions in the problem, the mean field energy is small, and the Liu Yang energy may be relevant even for a weakly interacting system. This is actually something which has been investigated now very recently and gives two very interesting uh, effects. So this Liu Yang correction is not always negligible, and in some cases can play a very important uh, role. Uh, Luis, uh, there is a question in the chat box, which I think you probably might have answered. So, so elaborate more on the relation of proton minima and superfluidity. Well, it is it is just simply that if, yeah. uh, first of all, the rotom, why the rotom minima is, is created, in the case of helium, the rotom minimum is created as a sort of precursor of your own crystallization. So basically you have a strong repulsion, yes, uh, between the particles. So the particles are, have a tendency to be separated at a given distance. And this minimum that you have in the energy at this particular at this particular momentum, right? This particular momentum P roton is associated with the inverse of some given length. And this some given length is associated with the mean density that you have in the problem, yes? So the mean separation between the particles. So the spectrum goes down because of that, first of all, yes? So the roton occurs because of the strong interactions in the case of helium. Now, if the, if the spectrum shows this roton minimum, right? Which as I say, in the case of helium is because of this, then if you join now this origin with the curve, yes, which is this, with this trick that I was telling to you here, based, so which is the idea of, the, uh, of this number of here, which is the idea of the Landau criterion, then you see that if you start joining points like this one with this one, this one with this one, this one, this one, this one, then you have to look for the minimal tangent, the minimal angle, if you want. And the minimal angle that you have here is the one given by the rotom. So this means that the velocity, uh, the critical uh, velocity for uh, superfluidity is given by the rotom minimum, yes, by this, uh, by, by this angle and not by the by the sound uh, <clears throat> in helium. In typical BEC experiments, 
the critical velocity is the sound velocity, but not for all. There are some experiments in particular, which is called dipolar gases, where you have also the presence of a roton eventually, and you may have also, with, which is due to different reasons, uh, but you have also this type of roton-like minimum. And, uh, and there you can have also that the critical superfluid velocity is, uh, is not the sound velocity. Okay, uh, so if there are any other question? Yeah. I, uh, uh, just before the bubble transformation, so uh, can one use this Hamiltonian for the squeezing also? Yes, yes, yes. So it is, uh, it is the, how good the, the squeezing is? It I is mean, the can one go? Okay. It is, so sorry, this, this type of interactions, uh, for example, <laughs> are used um, so this, uh, what is called this kernel linearity, right? <clears throat> is used in, um, in uh, atom optics to induce uh, squeezing in, in, in atoms. Yes. And you may actually get very large, uh, very large uh, squeezing. And it has been used to generate um, highly entangled uh, many, body, many body states of atoms. Yes. So, uh, so can one go beyond standard quantum limit there? Yes, yes, sure, sure. Yes. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> it has been already it has been shown in different systems uh, with this type of interactions, right? With this type of kernel linearity, also using what is called uh, parametric amplification. So it's similar to, to what you have in nonlinear uh, optics. Uh, so there are other systems which can be described more similar to what is called parametric amplification. And in both systems, they have shown the, that you can go beyond the standard quantum. Okay, and uh, how do people apply those Boglebov transformation experimentally? This is, a the this is a theoretical concept, of course, right? But you okay. can study experimentally the spectrum of excitations. You can prove the spectrum of excitation. And the Boglebov spectrum has been proved uh, so basically what you do in, 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 uh, in experiments, for example, is uh, using what is called Raman scattering. So um, you take two uh, waves here, two lasers with some momentum K and some frequency uh, omega one, K one omega one, K two omega two. And then you go up and down, right? And by going up and down, you get a given delta K and a given delta energy, right? Due to this difference of, uh, of frequencies. So this means that now you see the volume of the spectrum. This means that you can start here and end here or end here and so on. So you get this momentum and this energy. And when you do that, you hit resonances, right? And in this way, you can map, by the mapping these resonances, you can map the uh, the volume of the spectrum. This was done many, many years ago. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So if, uh, if no other question, uh, then uh, we will thank. Is, uh, I, have, I have a question. Okay, okay. please go ahead, yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, so when we say about the quantum depletion uh, in this case, so that means that you are talking about some uncondensation process, right? From the condensate. So, like uh, uh, seeing the Bogolyov spectrum that you actually shown, so there is a part that corresponds to the phonon excitation, and the other part that corresponds to the single particle excitation. So yes. can we somehow relate this phonon excitation with the number of uncondensed particles? Let's say. Uh, I mean, can well, we directly say that if we have phonon excitation that will correspond to the number of uncondensed particles? Uh, the, the, the largest contribution to the quantum depletion is actually coming from the phonon part of the spectrum. This is absolutely true. This is, this is directly related to that. It comes from low energies. Because you see for large energies, for large energies, the quasi particles are particles, yes? So large energies means like not having interactions. So large P squared over 2M here means like not having interactions anymore. 
So you see that the most, the, the major contribution to these stems here is actually coming from, for, from the, from the phonon part. But what, what I wanted to stress in here is that this stem is typically very small, but if A starts to increase, then this stem starts to gain in importance, right? And at some point you can imagine that all the theory crumbles basically down because, uh, because I am assuming from, from the very beginning that N series of the order of N. If I start to, to have a depletion which is comparable to, to N. So, so when this starts to be comparable to, to one, when this here starts to be comparable to one, of course, all the theory breaks down, yes. And, uh, and this tells you, this tells you everybody that um, something very important, which is that when the interactions increase, the whole idea of both instant condensation becomes more uh, doubtful and the, all the, the machinery that we are developing and we will continue developing tomorrow uh, using mean field ideas, basically, it starts to be doubtful to treat systems which are truly strongly interacting. So, and this is particularly the case, as, as we will see, uh, for the case of particles in optical lattices. So at this point, we cannot say that one phonon uh, corresponds to one uh, particle excitation. No, no, <clears throat> because okay. one phone, because quasi particle and particle is not the same. Yeah, so then we have to uh, do some calculus <clears throat> and uh, then say that how actually, how can we say that this much uh, number of phonons is going to correspond like one particle excitation? Well, right. well, first of all, first of all, quantum depletion is not given by the uh, uh, quantum depletion, of course, when the number of phonons is zero. Yes, <clears throat> so uh, I am assuming t equal to zero. So this means that the average number of phonons, yes, is zero, yes, <clears throat> because of the Bose Einstein uh, distribution, <clears throat> yes. <clears throat> but <clears throat> the, you see here, uh, when I do this sum, I am summing over different momenta, <clears throat> right? This V, this sum is dominated actually by the part given by the phonons. <clears throat> yes, because by the part which is given by the quasi particles for the quasi, for the, um, for in the particle part of the, of the branch. So basically in this, in this part of here, VP, this VP, when P is very large, P is large, is basically zero. So it's, it's basically dominated by the part associated with the phonons. You can see the contribution of quantum depletion for just a single excitation by just simply taking the corresponding VP square here. Okay. okay thank you. I had a question. Am I audible? Yes. Uh, so uh, using this approximation, is it possible to compute the I get the largest eigenvalue of uh, the one particle density matrix. Is it same as N naught? Yes. In the case after adding interactions. Uh, this I will comment in the in the next uh, in the next uh, lecture. But the highest eigenvalue is the condensate. Yes, and the associated eigenfunction is the what we will call the condensate wave function. Yeah, this we will discuss tomorrow. But the eigenvalue will be still n naught, or will it be? It's n naught. Yes. Okay, yeah. okay Luis. Uh, okay. Uh, it's yeah. It seems. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, it was a great lecture. Okay. So we will meet again uh, tomorrow at the same time. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Ciao. Thank you. Ciao. 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 Bye. 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 bye.